For over a century, governments and corporations have colluded to shape how you think. They socialize you. They hypnotize you into becoming a docile cog in a consumer machine. It's not an accident. This is all according to plan. Let's take a road trip. Have you ever been driving across the country, passing from state to state, and you notice all these towns sort of feel the same? You'll find the Walmarts, the Burger Kings, the strip malls filled with chain stores. Consumer culture has spread across the globe, and gradually it's stamping everywhere in its cookie-cutter mold. It wasn't always this way. Stuart Ewan, in his book Captains of Consciousness, provides us with a history of advertising in the early part of the 20th century. He shows us how Americans from diverse walks of life were trained to desire mass-produced goods that, just a few years before, they didn't know they wanted. Oh, don't do that. Why not? The coupon. Save the Raleigh coupon. What for? What for? These flower shears? That lawn sprinkler? I got them free. Free for Raleigh coupon. So if you're not saving that coupon, I'll take it. Oh, no, you don't. I'll just keep the coupon. How did that happen? Let's look at Henry Ford. He had a goal that every one of his factory workers could buy a Ford automobile. Was this complete selflessness on his part? Hardly. Ewan cites Edward Albert Feline, an American businessman, who wrote, In the great campaign for automobile supremacy, most of the candidates were of the opinion that they could get more dollars by appealing to the sort of person who had the largest number of dollars to spend. One firm then put out a $5,000 car, another one for $4,000, another car for $3,500. Mr. Ford offered a car on an entirely different theory. He would not appeal, he decided, to the sort of person who had the most money, but to the greatest number of people who had money enough to buy a car at the lowest price for which a serviceable car could be manufactured and sold. <laughs> Ford wasn't the only one who saw this opportunity. In the early 20th century, our manufacturing power was increasing. Now we were able to make more goods than the upper class could buy. From 1850 to 1920, the United States experienced the largest surge of immigration in its history. The tired, the poor, the huddled masses spoke a multitude of tongues and adhered to a wide array of often conflicting religious and cultural traditions. America has been called a melting pot, but these ingredients could clash, so the powers that be decided to turn up the heat. If you want your product to appeal to the masses, you need a mass to appeal to. In order to do that, advertising appealed to our instincts. Fear, lust, and shame were triggered by these campaigns. I can't believe it. It's my first blind date. Oh, I do it all the time. Really? You guys meet? Greg, Janice? We sure did. That was stupid. To see how this was done and why it was effective, let's take a look at this deodorant ad. This poor woman is the subject of gossip. She's got stinky pits. She's behind the times. If you're a guy, you don't want to be with her. And if you're a woman, you definitely don't want to be her. Suddenly, you've got an itch. You've been made aware of a deficiency you didn't even know you had. And now, you're a lifelong customer. These ads were translated in your local Yiddish, German, Polish, Italian papers. And some papers refused to play ball. But advertising was extremely lucrative for newspapers. And if you didn't get with the program, you were often out of circulation. Whatever wouldn't conform to market forces, whatever didn't fit in to the confines set by this new system, was soon lost and forgotten as a relic of the past. Ewan writes... Immigrants would be Americanized, a process identical to the abolition of their common memories and the replacement of them by a mass perception keyed to the vaulted aspirations of mass-produced goods. President Calvin Coolidge was quite direct in describing the purpose of marketing. It was, in his words, a form of education. We are taught what to want, and the market satisfies these appetites by producing products. He said, The uncivilized make little progress because they have few desires. 
the inhabitants of our country are stimulated to new wants in all directions. In order to satisfy their constantly increasing desires, they necessarily expand their productive power. They create more wealth because it is only by that method that they can satisfy their wants. It is this constantly enlarging circle that represents the increasing progress of civilization. For a nation claiming to be Christian, this sure doesn't sound very Christ-like. The goal of such education isn't to instill prudence, humility, and other virtues in those it forms. Rather, it's to generate and channel desire toward an increase in profits. To be fair, it's not all bad. Consumer culture helped create the American middle class, which in the last century raised the standard of living to the highest point it's been in human history. But whatever didn't fit into this consumerist model was pushed to the side or discarded entirely. Our spiritual and cultural values were reshaped and our souls were trained to long for the idols that we found on department store shelves. Now things are shifting again and rapidly. There may come a day when attention is more valuable than money. To learn more, check out my article in the description. Like and subscribe and I'll see you on the next video.